we have been friends with the Mitchells for years now. I don't have not done a count. I don't know how many years it's been, but it's been quite a while. John and Jackie have come and shared their ministry of the shepherds. Uh, Jackie's dad was a member of our church years ago, and uh, uh, John is, a, is the total package. He can preach. He can sing. He's got a heart for the things of God. He's one of the finest men I've, I've had the privilege of knowing. I've never said this before about anybody that's come and spoken, but if I was ever looking for a replacement, of course, Mark would be my replacement. But if Mark said, no, Stan, I don't, I don't think I want the job, John Mitchell would be a guy I would call and say, if he, see if he was interested in the job. He's that kind of man. So I'm privileged to turn the pulpit over to the two of them this morning and see what God has given them. I said the pastor, that's the scariest compliment he's ever given me. <laughs> he said some other things that were kind of, well, I won't go into that. I like but, the total package comment, though. I like yeah, that. Well, okay. Yeah, well, okay. Um, hey, this song is for you folks who are the behind-the-scenes people. Uh, you don't get noticed much. You're, you're the folks that clean the closet, clean the windows, make sure the snow is shoveled. Uh, you're not on the platform. But I sense that there's just a lot of teamwork that goes on in this church and, uh, and a lot of prayer. And so for all the behind the scenes folks, uh, a song called, I think I can say it here, Maplewood Methodist Church. <laughs> Spends every night inside these walls he Dumps the trash and sweeps the halls And he makes sure that stained glass shines Picks up papers in the pews And stacks the chairs in the choir room But his real work don't start till quitting time when he goes through every prayer request Lying on the preacher's desk He hits his knees and says God bless me, Summers be Lord, it's hard to live alone And Mary Anna Thompson wants her daddy back at home And Mr. Nelson needs forgiveness Old man Miller's crops need rain. While the whole town's fast asleep, he's hard at work. Pulling that midnight shift at the Maplewood Methodist Church. Every night's the same routine And by the time he finally leaves He's done so much more than clean the building He's called down angels from on high And helped someone through a sad goodbye And lost folks finally find what they've been missing the congregation will never see that simple man who still believes he can change the world by saying please give johnny may the strength to put that bottle down mrs bailey and her husband find a way to work things out and mrs olson hold on long enough to see her daughter's wedding day While the whole town's fast asleep He's hard at work Pulling that midnight shift At the Maplewood Methodist Church The sign out front says Sunday service starts at 9 and 10.15 but he holds his own revival seven nights a week. While the whole town's fast 
to sleep, he's hard at work, pulling that midnight shift at the Maplewood Methodist Church. Spends every night inside these walls, dumps the trash and sweeps the halls, and he makes sure that stained glass shines. Amen. Well, let's see. We are ready for some uh, pictures up here if we, if we have them. Folks, it's really great to be back again. It's always a treat to come here. We love coming to Cornerstone uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, it is a church that is just fun to be here. And as we've traveled around these 11 years for Shepherds, I think this church laughs more than other churches. I think that's a secret to growth. Um, and uh, uh, we just love to come and laugh and enjoy you folks. We appreciate your generosity over the years. You have been so gracious and so generous to shepherds. And uh, so many people with special needs have benefited from your partnership in this mission and in this ministry. And we are so grateful. Um, there is a uh, couple of videos I'd like to share. Uh, we'll see whether we have sound or not. I'm not sure. We had a little trouble at the beginning, but let's, uh, let's take a look. What you're looking at there is the administration building, the first building you see as you come on campus in a little town of Union Grove, Wisconsin, about an hour and 10 minutes north of Chicago is where Shepherds is located. And, um, and there you find people who are committed to serving one another.
We are really committed to honoring God by valuing people, and that's what Shepherds is all about, in seeking to help individuals with special needs live up to their God-given potential, help them make progress and love them, demonstrate respect for them. And uh, one of our newer staff members was so impressed with what she learned, um, what she sensed at Shepherds that uh, she wrote this. Jackie's gonna just share uh, what this individual wrote. We've uh, put a couple slides to accompany it. The, the title of her writing is Changing My Mind. I had limited exposure to people with intellectual disabilities when I was growing up. There was a teenage boy named Jeff in the house down the road from my childhood home. Whenever I saw Jeff, he was with a parent. He was protected by a very large growling guard dog. I walked by his house every day with my head down, hoping that he or his dog wouldn't notice me. Then there was another teenage boy named Eddie. He was the son of an out-of-state friend of my parents. I heard stories about Eddie throughout the years, but I only met him one memorable time. I didn't know how to act around Eddie the time we visited. I was 15 and being a girl, very self-conscious. I tried to talk to him once, but he didn't say anything. He just stared. I smiled once, but he didn't smile back. He just stared. So my very limited exposure to people with intellectual disabilities caused me to form a faulty perception, which was people with intellectual disabilities are unapproachable and very sad. This perception wasn't challenged until I started working at Shepherds. I saw that people with intellectual disabilities had personalities and character and charm. They had many moods and sad was only one of them. There was also chatter bickering, smiles, and laughter that filled the hours every day. And rarely, rarely did I see anyone just staring. They were active on all levels, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. If anyone currently shares the erroneous beliefs from my pre-Shepherd's years, I invite you to eat a meal with them at the Shepherd's table. Spend an evening singing bad karaoke with them. Talk to them about their families and God and their favorite dessert at Dairy Queen. They have a lot to say. Sure, some people with intellectual disabilities communicate non-verbally. Some of their noises sound an awful lot like moaning. But stop for a moment and really listen. Watch their expressions and listen to the inflections in their voices. They have something to tell you. They are excited, maybe angry. They have a story, hear them. And some people with intellectual disabilities stare. I do too when I'm writing. But when our residents stare, don't let it unnerve you. Look deep in their eyes and acknowledge them. Appreciate the soft gaze of satisfaction deep within. Or notice the pinch of confusion or the light of curiosity. Just don't turn away in discomfort as I once did. Thinking back, I wish I could take all that I learned at Shepherds in the last six years and give it to the little girl who wanted to be nice to Jeff but didn't know how. That little girl would have asked Jeff's dad if she could sit by the pond in their front yard with Jeff and talk about how crazy the ducks got when someone threw bread in the water. I wish I could tell my teenage self that Eddie was staring because girls didn't usually come over to his house. He didn't realize that hair could be teased so high. And I didn't realize how distracting my big sparkling earrings were to someone with sensory issues. I'd like to think that my teenage self would have been less self-absorbed and more patient, that I would have smiled more than once or asked him more than one question. Or maybe I should have stared back to let him know that I was aware of him and wanted to take the time to figure out this whole new form of communication. It took the people of Shepherds to teach me that disability doesn't equal sadness and separation. Disability is just one tiny part of the richness of our human experience. The other parts, purpose, faith, friendship, community, learning, talents, strengths, weaknesses, adventure, promise, love, loss, communication, caring. It's all there in every one of us. Shepherds changed my beliefs about disability. 
Now, in every other church, I would be done and I would go sit down. And John would be very relieved because he wouldn't have unleashed me. But he unleashed me this morning. <laughs> I had an experience just in, in the last couple weeks that reflects my change in my mind, in my attitude, in my perspective of those with disabilities. We're going through the downsizing process. Do you know what I mean by that? It's time to clean out, look at the things that have served their purpose and pass them along or put them out by the dumpster. We're gonna downsize, we're gonna possibly make a short, a little move, and it's time to go through everything and evaluate. So I've been in that evaluating mode. And one of those things I've been evaluating <clears throat> was the curio cabinet that I've been caring for faithfully for 29 years since my mother passed away. It held her small collection of teacups and some other little miscellaneous dishes. And I knew that the time would come when I would not have room for that amongst the other things that we have gathered over the years. My girls were not at a in a position where they wanted a curio cabinet to care for little detailed things. So I decided, okay, time to put that on Craigslist. And we immediately got a response. And so I immediately had to unload that, and I went through that tug of emotion as I took out some of my mother's sweet things that she had given, that I had given her. And I kept some, and I put them in my cabinet that John remade and refinished for me a few years ago. So I found them a new home, but that was good for me to go through that. Well, what I wasn't prepared for was the lady said, okay, my husband and my son will be by tonight and pick it up. And so I went through that furious task of cleaning out. And I heard the doorbell ring, and John answered the door. And um, the dad and his son came in, and I came around the corner. And to my surprise was a dad with his much shorter, obviously disabled son. So they came in, and um, I said hi to Jason, asked his name. He couldn't say his name. He couldn't speak so that I could really understand him. But I had learned that I need to talk to him and look into his eyes and ask the question anyway. And his dad answered for him, obviously. So I, uh, I got things ready. I packed up the shells very carefully. They were in a big hurry to get that out into the car, perfectly loaded in. And just before they left, um, I said to Jason, so Jason, what are you going to be putting in this cabinet? And his answer kind of stunned me and took me back. And at the same moment, I thought, Lord, you have such a sense of humor. Because right now in Jason's home, Jason is probably in his late 20s, maybe 30s. He had pulled out his crisp bills out of his, out of his wallet and given it to me and, and just could hardly wait to get out and leave with his treasure. And in his home right now, in my mother's lighted curio cabinet, stand all of his World Federation wrestling figurines. <laughs> and I know that he enjoys turning on the light in the evening and displaying that wonderful display that are things that are meaningful to him. So I thank God for changing my perspective, for seeing Jason as a person that has likes and things that mean something to him. We're hoping to have more connection with that family. We have no idea if we're saved or not if they're sa saved or not, if they know the Lord. And it wasn't the time to talk about that because Jason had to get home with that curio cabinet for his figurines. Yes, that was quite a moment. Well, um, listen, at Shepherds, we have kind of two sides of Shepherds, the residential care side and some special ministry side. On the special care side, we're still doing the Endeavor program with those who just will never learn to, to live independently. Um, we have about 70 individuals living on campus. Um, the Catalyst program, we have about 30 individuals living off campus in, uh, in community housing that we provide services for that once were residents at Shepherds, but they've learned to live with kind of a supported self-sufficiency. Individuals come in uh, for two weeks or two months as part of our respite care program to give mom and dad a caregiver break. And uh, we have individuals coming in just for the day. On the special ministry side, we're running four weeks of camp now uh, during the summer. 
And of course, Shepherd's College began in 2008. We began with six students. We have 60 students now. Uh, they are all living on campus, along with these 70 others. And then um, some of the students, some parents were saying, you know, my, my, my loved one is, is not a fit for Shepherd's College. They don't really have a third grade reading level. But um, uh, what, what else do you have? Well, we had a start a pilot program called Shepherd's Academy, a two-year program that has a lot to do with social skills and living skills. And so Shepherd's College is a three-year uh, diploma program. Shepherd's Academy is a two-year program. Shepherd's College is now fully accredited. And so mom and dad can fill out their FAFSA forms, and, uh, but uh, yet the curriculum is a God-centered, Christ-centered curriculum. Shepherd's Resources is something new. Uh, we have, uh, if you go to shepherdsresources.org, you can go online, we have a number of 10 minute, we call them take tens, modules that uh, deal with the issue of autism and uh, various issues as it relates to intellectual disabilities. It gives us uh, not only a national but an international reach online. And so that is a source. And if you have uh, uh, friends or neighbors that are wrestling with whether or not they're going to allow their child to, uh, their child with special needs to take the next step and either go to school or go to some place away from home, they need to see the Take 10 that is done by uh, one of our staff, Dr. Russ Kincaid, called Letting Go. It is wonderful, shepherdsresources.org. And the Shepherds College, we continue to provide uh, horticulture and culinary arts. Um, when we were there in April, the, uh, our very first missions team got back from Jamaica. Um, these are college students, all with special needs. And uh, uh, they were so excited, they were wound up. And, uh, and I would sense that probably these kids never thought that they would be used of God to go to a foreign culture and work with poor children in a, with a veteran missionary and running a VBS program in Jamaica. But here they are. Here, here's one of the kids that they worked with. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for them. It was a great mission. And when <laughs> I couldn't resist this one, mission accomplished, but they are wiped out. They're on their way home now. And uh, so that was just a really exciting time. So you've been a part of bringing great joy to our residents, to our college students, to academy students, and uh, we just want to say thank you so much. We have not swerved from these five non-negotiables. We hire only born-again staff, high priority on the Word of God. We don't receive any direct government funding, and so uh, we are dependent on local churches, Christian businessmen, Christian foundations to help support shepherds so that we can maintain that Christ-centered curriculum. And you've been a part of that. We just want to say thank you. There's a brochure on the back table with, um, with Craig's name uh, picture on it. And uh, we call that our Beyond the Basics program. Uh, there are needs that the individuals have. A number of our individuals are orphans. They have no family whatsoever. Needs come up that uh, they can't afford. And so Beyond the Basics is designed to provide needs that are beyond their ability to pay, that are real necessities for these individuals. And you can pick up one of those brochures and pray about whether God would have you be a part of that or not. It's called Beyond the Basics. Uh, volunteers, a big deal. So if you've got a motor home, we got all the hookups out there. You can come out and hook up and, and be a part of our volunteer program. Last year, 18,000 hours of volunteer labor. Uh, you figure, multiply that times the minimum wage, and that's quite a contribution. So we, we really value that uh, a great deal. Uh, Probably one of my favorite videos, 10 Tips for Communication. This is from our residents. You'll recognize a few of these people because some of them were in the bell choir that was actually here a couple years ago. So if you do come as a volunteer or if you're just communicating with people with special needs in your own church, your own neighborhood, here's a 10 things to keep in mind. Communicating with people who have disabilities is easier if you remember these simple rules. Speak to me and not my case manager. Shake my hand when we meet. 
Identify yourself when meeting a person who is blind. If you offer to help me wait till I say yes. Three adults as adults. Do not lean on anybody's wheelchair. Listen carefully to the people who have trouble speaking and let them finish. Talk to a person in a wheelchair at I live at. Tap a person who is deaf on the shoulder. Relax. Don't be in the list. It doesn't matter what you say to us. Well, we won't go through all those. I'm sure you can remember many of them just by picturing the residents as they shared. Uh, if I were to ask you, what, what, are the, what was the warmest moment in that? I would have to say for me, it was, uh, it was the last one where Steve Wallace says, don't, don't relax, don't be embarrassed. It doesn't matter what you say to us, just talk to us. And you know, I have great admiration for Steve. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm in a, a real dilemma right now. I don't think we're going to show that, that last uh, that video. It, it's a real fun one, but I'm looking at the clock. Pastor finishes at 11 o'clock, right? I think he's showing video. <laughs> um, okay. So we'll show the video and we'll have a 12-minute message. How's that? <laughs> it, <laughs> um, the culinary arts students at Shepherds hosted a farmer's appreciation dinner for our local farmers. These are not all believers, but this is our outreach to our community to reach out to the farmers in our neck of the woods, uh, individuals that have probably always wondered what's, what happens on campus. Now some of them are believers and understand Shepherds, some not. So this is our outreach ministry and uh, this is, uh, uh, you'll appreciate the very spiritual music that goes along with this. I sat beside a man from Hollywood, California on a plane. He said he had rich and famous friends. Yeah, he liked dropping names. I said, well, how'd it do? It's good for you. I dig a lot of those actors. But son, you ain't got a thing on me. See, I got friends with tractors. They'll grow your groceries, haul a load, pull you out, then fix the road. They're good at slowing speeders down when they pass through from out of town. I live out in the country happily ever after. I got everything I need. I got friends with tractors On Friday night we hit the woods Go bogging in our trucks It's just about a guarantee Some good old boy gets stuck Where I come from you can bet you But a mud hole ain't a factor I'll sink mine to the floorboard Cause I got friends with tractors And they'll grow your groceries Haul alone, pull you out Then fix the road Pass through from out of town I'll live out in the country Happily ever after I got everything I need Cause I got friends with tractors yeah. I've been to fancy five-star restaurants And I left there barely fed They charged me for the water The butter and the bread that gourmet meal looked more to me like fish bait on a cracker But I'll stay fat and happy Cause I got friends with tractors And they'll grow your groceries all alone Pull you out and fix the road They're good at slowing speeders down When they pass through from out of town We'll live out in the country Happily ever after I got everything I need Cause I got friends with tractors Yeah, I got everything I need I got friends with tractors. Yeah. Yeah, man. Talking about internationals and John Deere's. Massive 
Ferguson's, whatever you got. We don't discriminate. Front end loaders, bush hogs, post hole diggers. I do know one actor. Is Larry the cable guy an actor? Oh well. He got a track. Well, after that, I do hope to see you next year. Uh, I'll just men I'll mention one project that, uh, that that we're working on. Shepherds is going green, and we have. Um, um, we, we had some research done and discovered that uh, with about a $65,000 investment, um, we could save about $700,000 over the next 10 years and uh, by, by changing our lighting. I mean, we have a lot of buildings, a lot of lights, um, a 90-acre campus. I mean, and uh, so um, we received a $15,000 grant from a, um, a local utility company to make the change. We're trying to raise $50,000. The payback for that, so we have to put in $50,000. The payback for that in the savings is 10 months. Can you believe that? And so, um, so we believe that is a good investment, that that's good stewardship. I don't know whether that is something that holds any interest for this church or any of you as individuals, but it is a winner. And uh, I believe it's an example of the good stewardship and the kind of homework that we do at Shepherds in order to try to save as much as we can and be good stewards of the resources that God gives us. So um, just put that in the back of your mind, and you can pray about that. And... Uh, um, um, just let the Lord lead. Uh, okay. It's been a good morning already, though, hasn't it? <laughs> it's, it's been fun. And uh, I can just see those World Wrestling Federation figurines in that cabinet, <laughs> fully lighted with the glass shelving, so the light goes clear to the bottom. It's, it's just wonderful. Uh, and I'm sure Jason is smiling. I mentioned that I have great admiration for Steve, the, the last individual pictured in the video. His name is Steve Wallace. You, some of you may have sung, heard Steve sing, It Will Be Worth It All. You will remember that song long after you have forgotten Maplewood Methodist Church. So, um, and um, Steve, I, I admire him for two reasons. Number one, because of his service. Steve was the face of shepherds for 25 years. He traveled all around the country with Dr. Andrew Wood without a GPS, without cell phones, and, and found little churches all over the country that supported shepherds and have supported shepherds, for some of them for 50 years. Shepherds has been going for 60 years. We just didn't start recently. Um, I didn't think I would be with Shepherds for 11 years. Jack and I thought in 2004, well, we'll commit for five years and then probably slide back into local church ministry. And I have to tell you, it just keeps getting better. In fact, the first video we showed of Shepherds was called The Best is Yet to Come. It was an old VHS thing. We had to have a big, big VHS machine and then an even bigger projector. And, uh, I, it, it's, I couldn't even carry that stuff at this age now, but, uh, but we did back then. So I admire Steve for his service, and I admire Steve for his self-awareness. Dr. Andrew Wood, while they were on tour, would say, Steve, what are, you, what are you looking forward to? And Steve would say, I'm looking forward to heaven when I'll be like everybody else. He knew. He was self-aware. He recognized that he had intellectual disabilities. Um, you would hear him reference Philippians 3.24, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Um, and I would say, as I, have, as I have rubbed shoulders with individuals over the past 11 years from shepherds, I would have to say, while we regard them as less able, there is a simple, joyful consciousness of dependence on the Lord that I think we can learn from. When I speak in situations like this, 
Typically, the focus is on the individuals at Shepherds. Um, and, and, and remembering that they are of value. They are created by God. They are as valuable to God as we are. They, those who place their faith in Christ are every bit as much of the body of Christ as we are. But today, I'd like to change that focus and allow those at Shepherds to be a mirror in which we are see ourselves more accurately. See, as I looked at those at shepherds and, and saw their conscious dependence on the Lord, and often you would hear them express the key verse, Philippians 4.12, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All of a sudden, they became a mirror that helped me see myself more clearly and my own disability. And I suspect that many of you suffer from this ability, this disability too. It is called self-reliance. I was reading a book called Disability in the Gospel. I got to page 71, and this statement leaped from the page, maybe because these things were on my mind. It says, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is self-reliance. Our problem is that self-reliance is so highly valued in our culture. I mean, you think about it. Jackie and I kind of got into this TV program called The Alone Show. Any, any of you see it up here? Uh, the last episode was Thursday night, August 19th. Um, ten men tried to survive as long as they could in the wilderness of Vancouver Island, British Columbia. They took ten men and placed them about, about four miles apart. Anybody remember this program? A few of you, a few of you saw it. And they, care, they can only carry in what they can put on their backpack. And so they're alone in this harsh environment and, you know, with a hatchet. And some of them had a fishing pole. They built shelters. They have to fend off predators. Uh, all the while documenting themselves on these little GoPro cameras. And it is like the ultimate test of man's will for survival and self-reliance. And finally, the last man is standing after eight weeks, 50, 56 days, eating snails and slugs and rodents. And I mean, it was, it was a little gruesome. But triumphantly, he gets his reward of half a million dollars because he was the winner of the self-reliant contest. Then, then I was reading D.A. Carson, a notable preacher he says, Western culture is deeply infected by triumphalism. It destroys humility. It minimizes grace. He says, the church is so easily and unknowingly infected by our culture. Why, we have turned pastors into CEOs instead of shepherds for the weak. Our search committees often search for the sophisticated, the handsome, the charismatic, who know how to use the latest business models and achieve measurable success. I mean, we see it everywhere. But in sharp contrast, we come to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul is writing to a young church of entrepreneurs, um, uh, young believers, and they're, they live in a wealthy culturally proud uh, center in Corinth. And in, in the area of Corinth, there's this, there's this like four mile wide stretch of land between two oceans. They call it the Isthmus. I can hardly say it, and I only dare try it once. But Corinth controlled both harbors on both sides of this four mile stretch of land. And the smaller ships, they would take out of the water and just push them along a paved four mile road to the other side. The larger ships would come in rather than go around the dangerous southern area of Greece, they would just unload the ships, transport the products across that four mile stretch, reload it on another ship and avoid the, the treacherous route south. So it was, a, it was a tremendous cultural center. And, uh, and Paul, writing to these Corinthian believers, warns against any pretense of self-reliance or self-confidence. He says, there is no cause for boasting. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. You can turn to it if you want to. I'm going to begin reading in the interest of time. Where, where is the wise... Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many noble, not many mighty are called. Um, it was in the 19th century, kind of an amusing situation. A, a, a sincere believer in the British aristocracy, her name was Lady Huntington. And she said, you know, I thank God for the letter M, M-A-N-Y, not many of noble birth, rather than A-N-Y, not any of noble birth. And uh, she made a big deal of that. Verse 27, but God has chosen, what? The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The base things of the world and the things which are despised as God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, what's it say, let him glory in the Lord. God uses the weak to confound the mighty. The despised hath he chosen. Those residents at Shepherds have been a mirror to help me see, I believe, more accurately how God sees me. God often uses under the underrated to do the unexpected. I was reminded of a story of, uh, from, from some years ago. Um, the biggest diamond ever discovered. It was in 1905. I mean, the largest uncut diamond ever discovered was found in a mine in South Africa. <laughs> it was over 3,000 carats. Can you imagine? It weighed 1.7 pounds. It's like, behave yourself over there, Stan. Are, are, they, are they behaving themselves? Okay. I, I thought I caught something out of the corner of my eye. This diamond had to be transported from Africa to England where it was to be cut and become part of the crown jewels of British royalty. And the authorities had to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? And so they secured an armored boat with multiple security guards. They ceremoniously placed the package in the captain's safe on the armored ship with round-the-clock protection so that no one would get to the fake diamond. Meanwhile, the priceless jewel was shipped by parcel post <laughs> in a plain brown box and arrived safely in England in this unassuming package containing a jewel of untold wealth. You know, God uses unassuming vessels to deliver valuable lessons in life. That's one of the things that Shepherds has changed my mind about, for sure. Um, when, one moment frozen in my mind is when I met a worship leader down in, in New Jersey who said, I taught special needs children for a while. I've shared this before. I don't know whether I've shared it here or not. But he wrote a song. He said, I want you to have this song. Take it with you, maybe you can use it sometime. And one verse in that song says, these are God's special children. They've gotten through to me. They're God's special children. Each day I find they love me all the time. And I wonder why that it can't be there isn't more of them in me. Well, I kind of sense that Bill looked in the mirror and saw his need to be a giver of unconditional love as he looked in the mirror that was provided by those children with special needs. Um, and I, I think it begs the question, you know, we, as, as we serve and support people with special needs and with unique kinds of disabilities, we need to realize they are more like us than they are different from us. They are us. Through them, we get a more accurate picture of how God sees us. And I really believe, folks, 
that we are more needy in God's eyes than they are in our eyes. So what does self-reliance look like? When God sees us being self-reliant, what is God seeing us depend on? Well, in David's day, remember Psalm 27? Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Well, some trust in personal discipline. Some trust in being nice. Some trust in the admiration and affection of our spouse or our children. Some trust in our financial security, some in our intelligence. Some trust in our status or standing in the church. Some may trust even in their Bible knowledge. But any of those things, though they all be good when out of balance, they show up as the disability of self-reliance. Oh, God, deliver us. And sometimes God delivers us gently. Sometimes he delivers us through influential people. Sometimes through circumstances that we would never choose. I had opportunity to visit my nephew in Idaho, Boise, Idaho, this past summer. Um, and I saw in them a trust and growth in their dependence on the Lord as they, as God allowed, a special needs child to be born into their family. It was a very, very difficult time for them. Little Mitch, that child, died at five years of age, but Mitch's mom, Karen, writes, you know, we were told by our doctors that our baby had a rare brain disorder, one that affects only four children in a million. The doctor told us that Mitchell would never walk or talk, and he would never be more than an infant. He would have respiratory disorders, and the doctor was surprised he wasn't already suffering from seizures. The landscape of our lives was drastically changed. And I saw maturity and growth in them as a result of all of that. Well, Mitch passed away at five, and at his funeral, a friend of the family wrote this. She said, does God grieve because we are not normal? I think God grieves because we think we know what normal is. And we settle for normal. When God seeks surrender and willingness to let him carry us and change us into the image of Christ. I was at a church not too long ago and I was thinking about this. And they sang a song that, um, I'm just going to quote it, I'm not going to sing it, but I believe it reflects the opposite of self-reliance. And the question is, how do, we get, how do we get off this trail? How do we get off the self-reliant trail? Well, I believe we do it by running to Christ and giving our attention to Christ in every situation. Here's how this writer poses it. I run to Christ when chased by fear and find refuge sure. Believe in me, his voice I hear, his, his words and wounds secure. I run to Christ when torn by grief and find abundant peace. I too had tears, he gently speaks. Thus joy and sorrow meet. Oh, I run to Christ when worn by life and find my soul refreshed Come unto me, he calls through strife, and fatigue gives way to rest. I run to Christ when vexed by hell and find a mighty arm. The devil flees, the scriptures tell, but he roars but cannot harm. And I run to Christ when stalked by sin and find a sure escape. Deliver me, I cry to him, and temptation yields to grace. And I run to Christ when plagued by shame, and find my one defense. I bore God's wrath. He pleads my case, my advocate and friend. I would just say in conclusion, oh God, deliver us from the disability of self-reliance. And when we serve or we give to those with special needs, folks, I trust it will be a mirror to remind us 
of our own weakness and our own need to rely wholly on the Lord. And when you give to shepherds and to assist these people with unique needs, I trust that you will feel richer, not poor, for being part of this mission. And maybe you're here this morning and you've, you've never participated in God's grace. Um, you know, Steve said, I can't wait for heaven when I'll be like everybody else. And I would just say to you, does your story end in heaven? There's three statements in the song that I just read. It said, Jesus says, believe in me. He says, come to me. And he says, I bore God's wrath for you. And I'm reminded of 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ has also once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. I trust your story ends in heaven. And if it doesn't, you can change that today. And if you feel a tug in your heart, if you feel a prompting, if you feel a hunger, I believe that's probably the Holy Spirit saying to you, today's the day that you need to make the decision. And allow those with special needs to be the mirror that God used to reveal your own neediness and need for Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can uh, that we can be touched with laughter, we can be touched with joy and praise, we can be touched with emotion. And Father, we pray that as we, uh, as we move through this day, that our hearts would be sensitive to our need for you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize those areas where we tend to be too self-reliant. And may we run to Christ when we're afraid, when we're tempted, when we're vexed by fear, when we're just worn out and weary, Lord. I just pray that we would run to Christ. And for some, anyone who is here this morning that uh, doesn't really know that their destination is in heaven, Lord, I just pray that you would minister to them, give them the courage to say something to somebody, but mostly to speak to you and just say, Lord Jesus, I recognize today that I have no assurance that my story ends in heaven. But I do believe that you died on the cross for me and that you have said today, believe in me, come to me. I realize today that you bore God's wrath and I might have a right standing before you. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. I place my faith in you today. Is there anyone here that wants to express that? We're not gonna ask you to come forward, but if by an uplifted hand, we'd like to recognize that uh, just between you and I and God, anyone, just with the uplifted hand, hold it high so I can see it. Lord, we thank you for your, the graciousness of grace. And Lord, may we uh, live a life where we can be as aware of our needs as Steve Wallace is of his. We thank you in Jesus' name.